This tutorial is going to begin our introduction to the way waves propagate along waveguides. And that's something that happens using total internal reflection. So to get this project started, we're going to talk in this tutorial about the slopes of electric field when there are interfaces. We're going to consider a case that's not total internal reflection, which is easier, and then we're going to think about the case of total internal reflection. So since we're considering total internal reflection overall, we want to consider cases where, a, where the medium where a wave is propagating is an N1, which is greater than a medium that it's arriving at at an interface N2. So this could, for instance, be glass or the core of a waveguide, and this would be the cladding of the waveguide or air, something of a lower refractive index. So let's start out by considering the case where the incident angle theta 1 is less than the critical angle. I'm going to quickly throw up here the typical geometry that we always use. So we have an interface, we have an incident beam with our amplitude E incident, which in normalized units we'll say that it has an amplitude of 1. And this is an S polarized beam. We're going to confine ourselves to that discussion. Our coordinate system here is going to be written this way. We'll, we'll describe the uh, normal to the interface as the x hat direction. Up is y hat and out of the board at u. So the direction of the polarization is z hat. We're going to look at this, at this situation in two different orientations, which is why I'm drawing this here for you now. So we've got S polarized light reflected and S polarized light transmitted. This is the glass side. This is the air side. So that's our N1 and our N2. And we have a reflection coefficient, R sub S, and a transmission coefficient, T sub S, for the strength of the electric fields that, comp that comprise this plane wave and this plane wave. So as I said, let's look at this in a different orientation. And that different orientation is going to be, we'll still have the same interface, but we look at that electric field coming up out of the board at us. We're now going to make that be vertical. So the incident wave, I'm going to draw that really close to the interface. Here's that amplitude 1 oscillation up and down at the interface. And then we've got a reflected wave. In the case of glass, going towards air, the refractive index here is smaller than here, then the reflected beam has a positive amplitude when the incident beam has a positive uh, sign as well. So that's the relative phasing of 1 and RS. They go up and maximize at the same time vertically. And then we've got a transmitted beam whose amplitude looks like this, TS. And it is really true that TS is greater than 1. This has been discussed elsewhere, and because we're in a more rarefied medium, air versus glass, there's nothing wrong with the electric field being larger than the incident electric field. It does not mean that the transmitted pointing vector is larger than the incident pointing vector. That would be an energy conservation problem. Just to be clear about the coordinate system here, we are now defining this upward direction, as I said, to be the z hat direction, and the Normal to the interface is still x hat. That leaves the y hat vector going into the board. The important thing here is the reflection coefficient, rs. As drawn here, and as we have solved for, we know that the reflection coefficient has got the same phase as the incident beam. So the r the reflected beam has the same phase as the incident beam, and what's different of, is the amplitude. So this is going to be the opposite of what we find when there's total internal reflection, where the phase will be different, but the amplitude is the same. But for now, we've got same phase, different amplitude. And let's think about how that amplitude changes as the angle changes the reflection coefficient goes gets larger as the incident angle gets larger so as we come at more steep angles 
we get a larger and larger reflection coefficient. Now if we just look at the, if we picture what the waves look like in space, if I draw a little axis here just to indicate zero electric field strength, the incident wave, if we think about what it looks like right at the boundary, right here, let's choose a point where it is at its maximum of its oscillation. So there's, here's the boundary right here that we're talking about. And that electric field depicted through space looks something like this. So this is a propagating electric field plane wave going this way, and I'm catching it at a moment when it's at its maximum of its oscillation right at the boundary. So according to what we've got here about the reflection coefficient, I'll draw that one in blue. The reflected wave has the same amplitude, sorry, has the same phase as the incident wave. So when, when the incident wave is at the maximum of its oscillation, so is the reflected wave, but it doesn't have the same amplitude. So it's maybe this is the amplitude of the reflected wave's oscillation. And it's going to be oscillating the same way as the incident beam. So right here, these two oscillations going up and down like that, that's the same thing as these two oscillations going up and down together like that. And what's important to see here is that right at the boundary, at this moment that we've caught this wave, we see that the variation of the incident electric field versus x is zero, right? This is a maximum. So the DE incident dx is zero. Again, I'm analyzing the electric field at various points with the same y and z coordinates, but different x coordinates and plotting those like this. So the variation of the incident electric field normal to the boundary is zero at this point. So what you can see at the boundary is that since the reflected wave is in phase with the incident wave, this blue wave too has reached a point of, of maximum where its slope, where the D ins, DE reflected DX is also zero. And since the total electric field on the left-hand side is the sum of these two waves, and let's remember for completeness here that the blue wave is traveling in that direction. So we have this partial standing wave here, and that partial standing wave right here at that extremum point, we can say that DE left-hand side of the interface, or DE1, dx, since each of the two components of that partial standing wave have a slope of zero. But we know from other considerations at, at boundaries that the derivative, the, the slope of the field on the left with respect to x has to equal the slope of the field on the right with respect to x. So that means that the field on the right-hand side of the boundary also has to meet this location with a zero slope. And that tells us, in a sort of graphical way, that the E transmitted, um, that its x-dependence has to be oscillatory like this. An oscillation on the right-hand side an oscillation on the other side of this interface here, if it's an oscillation, it can here have, right at this point here, it can have zero slope. If you think about the other possibility that we're considering when we do total internal reflection of an exponential decay, like we have in, in a total internal reflection case for the penetration into the, for, into the air region, there is no way that you can get an exponential decay to have a zero slope. So, unless the exponential decay goes on forever, which is what you get right at total internal reflection, where you can't tell the difference between it, whether it's a sine wave or an exponential decay. But as soon as the incident radiation goes beyond the critical angle, and the exponential decay has some fall off, you can no longer have a, have a slope match there, so you can't satisfy Maxwell's equations. 
This is one way of relating to the fact that we have to have an oscillating wave on the right-hand side in the case where we're below the critical angle. Now, if we consider the other case for total internal reflection, that's when theta 1 is greater than the critical angle, of course. And what happens in this case? We now have that E reflected has the same amplitude as E incident, right? This is total internal reflection. So it's the same amplitude, same amplitude as E incident, but the phase now is different. So that's a key difference. It turns out that it's a phase lead for S polarized light. It's a phase lead, and that lead increases as theta 1 itself increases. So the farther beyond the critical angle you get, the more the reflected waves phase at the boundary leads the incident beam's phase. And if we look, draw a picture like this of the incident and reflected waves there, again, let's go to the boundary. We consider right at the boundary, we consider to moment, choose a moment in time when the incident wave is at a maximum of its oscillation like this. So here again is that oscillation. And if there is a phase lead, that means that the reflected wave is has just as much magnitude, but it's on its it is now on its way down from having recently reached a maximum. It's it's leading, it's already ahead. So it's heading downwards. And that means that the reflected wave looks like this in space. The reflected wave is heading this way. The incident wave is heading this way. But this guy is ahead in its oscillation, so it's a phase lead. So what you notice here, at the maximum at the maximum of the E incident oscillation, we find, unlike the case below the critical angle, where RS is in phase with one, and they each, and when one has a slope of zero, the other one has a slope of zero at the maximization. But at the maximum of the E incident oscillation, it's now the case that the derivative of the reflected wave de lowercase r dx, you can see that that is negative. It's less than zero. Therefore, the sum of the red and blue curves, which is the, which is the total electric field on the left-hand side, overall, the slope of the electric field on the left-hand side of the interface, I call that e left here, so let me cons be consistent, the derivative of e left with respect to x is less than zero, and therefore, since the slopes have to equal on the two sides of the interface, the derivative of E right, capital R, D E R D X, is less than zero. Let's now do the same reasoning we did over here. If the total electric field on the left-hand side has a slope of zero, then the total electric field on the right has a slope of zero, and that means sinusoids are what allow us to balance that boundary condition of the slope being continuous. Now we've got the opposite. We have a downward slope at that location. Therefore, the electric field on the right has to have a downward slope. That makes us start thinking about X dependence being like this, an exponential decay, not like this. You might think that it's possible to match, say, this part of a sine wave that has a downward slope with the downward slope of the electric field on the left-hand side here, but it turns out that it doesn't work. Here's the real take-home of all of this. In the case below the critical angle, as RS increases, we have less transmission of power into the air region. So there is a propagating wave going into the air, but there's less power carried in that beam because the reflection coefficient is going up. Now, what about this case? In this case, it's not the reflection coefficient's magnitude that's increasing. 
it's the amount of that phase lead that's increasing. So what we could say is that the phase, as the phase lead goes up, we get more and more of a separation between the blue and the red. We get a more and more steep amount of this blue curve contributing at the boundary. If you imagine pushing this blue curve back just a little bit, you get an even, you, you start to have this part or this part contribute to the slope. It's getting steeper and steeper. And so when the phase lead increases, in other words, as we tune to higher and higher angles, what you get is a steeper slope. And then you get a steeper decay. It turns out that as the slope of the starting point gets steeper, it's also true that the, that the exponential decay happens over a shorter distance in terms of its 1 over e length. So there's a real parallel here. We start out at normal incidence and start increasing the angle of incidence. We get less and less transmission of that beam, but we always have a zero slope at the boundary. Then as we get to the critical angle and beyond it, we start to not have a zero slope of the field on the left-hand side, the net field, and so we have a slope at the boundary of the transmitted field, and that corresponds to a decay. And what's critical is that the amount of shift tells you the steepness of the decay. Whenever total internal reflection is happening, there's a direct relationship between the amount of phase shift that's suffered by the reflected beam and the steepness of the decay into the forbidden zone. And when we talk about waveguides, we're going to leverage that insight extensively.